I just wanted to speak about the Titan submersible that went down to the Titanic wreck to have a look at it with these billionaires on board and such the irony I would say of the rich being able to be the ones that got tickets to be on the Titanic and yet their wealth could not save them and they you know died just like anybody else you know whether they were rich or poor it didn't matter and now we've got these extremely wealthy people on the submersible and going down out of curiosity to look at the Titanic wreck um, I find it very strange. I think it's way too risky to be in a little tiny submersible like that with, you know, not having extra oxygen or anything like that. I just find that rather crazy. I think it's kind of, um, to me, the whole shipwreck of the Titanic has always just freaked me out. And they brought up a piece of the hull of the Titanic. The first time they attempted to bring up this piece, I believe it was in 1996, and when they almost got it to the surface there, it slipped off and went back down to the ocean floor. So two years later, they brought it up, and they actually got it out of the water, and they put it in Las Vegas in the Luxor Hotel, which is, you know, like of the Pharaoh, <laughs> which I just think is unbelievable because, you know, Pharaoh was also rich and had slaves underneath him, but the people that built the Titanic, they were like pretty much very hard workers treated almost like slave labor, and very interesting parallels there I believe um, the whole thing I think is just really strange how they've turned the Titanic disaster catastrophe into something uh, like a tourist destination very strange and peculiar you know this is where people died tragically the whole thing was eerie and freaky to begin with but the ship is really, I believe, under God's curse. And many things have happened dealing with the Titanic and her sister ships, the Olympic and the Britannic. So, you know, these were ships that were supposed to be unsinkable. And the thing that always got me were the words of Captain Smith and the builder of the ship and here's what he said what did Captain Smith say about the Titanic anyhow declared Captain Smith the Olympic is unsinkable and the Titanic will be the same when she's put in commission why he continued either of these vessels could be cut in halves and each half could remain afloat indefinitely the non-sinkable vessel has been reached in these two wonderful craft. It was so wrong, the vessel broke in half and each half sank and did not stay afloat. And it basically sank in two and a half hours. So Captain Edward John Smith mocked God by saying about the Titanic that even God himself couldn't sink this ship. It also says that Thomas Andrews was inspired to build a ship that would be legendary during his time. After the construction of the mighty Titanic, a British luxury liner, a reporter asked him how safe the Titanic would be. With an ironic tone, he said, even God himself couldn't sink the ship. So, God made sure the ship did sink to show who was boss and who was in control because God is not mocked. What did Philip Franklin say about the Titanic? 
He said, we place absolute confidence in the Titanic. We believe the boat is unsinkable. Philip Franklin, vice president of White Star Line, owners of Titanic. What was Captain Smith's last words? Because he went down with the Titanic after having said that God couldn't sink it. Captain Smith, having done all man could do for the safety of passengers and crew, remained at his post on the sinking ship until the end. His last message to the crew was, Be British. I think that's interesting because if King Charles III, who's the British monarch, winds up being the one that Israel places on the throne, isn't it ironic that all of this tragedy happened because they thought that they, you know, well, they had the largest royal navy in the world at the time, and they were very skilled at being the best royal navy ever. So we had these ships that were supposed to be the largest ever built that they built, and, you know, they said those words about God. He served as a master of numerous White Star Line vessels, which the Titanic was of the White Star Line. He was the captain of RMS Titanic and perished when the ship sank on her maiden voyage. Smith received the honor rank of Commodore as the White Star Line's most senior captain and also held the rank of commander on the retired list of the Royal Navy Reserve. So the scripture says in Galatians 6 verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we put God to the test and God won. In Psalm 78 verse 41 it says about the Hebrews in the wilderness, yes again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power the day when He redeemed them from the enemy. So He performed all these signs before them just like the two witnesses will be able to do when he sends them. So by saying that even God couldn't sink that man-made ship is extremely blasphemous and it was tempting God and limiting him and his power. So God showed them, the rich, that their money could not save them. Their wealth could not save them and their ship sank. While the ship was being constructed, eight people died during the ship's construction. But only five of their names are known. Samuel Scott, John Kelly, William Clark, James Dobbin, and Robert Murphy. A plaque memorializing the eight men in Belfast was unveiled in 2012. In addition, some unknown number of workmen lost limbs in the Belfast shipyards where Titanic was built. According to the trade journal, the manufacturer, during Titanic's construction, it says, 246 injuries were recorded, 28 of them severe, involving severed arms by machines or legs crushed under falling pieces of steel. Now, I hope a lot of you caught the expedition unknown with Josh Gates going to the excavation site of Bethsaida. But he also had gone on the submersible and was going to go film the Titanic site, but he felt there were too many safety issues with the submersible. So he opted not to film the Titanic and not to go on that mission. It said, um, 
Fox News reported about Josh Gates. Missing Titanic sub did not perform well, says veteran explorer who nixed documentary over safety concerns. Veteran explorer Josh Gates, who hosts the TV series Investigating Myths and Legends Around the World, revealed on Twitter Wednesday that the missing Ocean Gate sub did not perform well when he went on a dive aboard the vessel himself. The 21-foot deep sea submersible vanished Sunday morning during an attempt to reach the shipwrecked Titanic, which sank in the Atlantic on the way to New York from England in 1912. Gates, who hosts Expedition Unknown on Discovery, had gone with Stockton Rush. He's one of the ones in the submersible now that's trapped. The Ocean Gate CEO, who is now among the five missing along with the Titan sub, on a test dive before the vehicle's first visit to the Titanic site. Gates wrote that he missed a chance to see the wreck himself due to fears about Ocean Gate's actual capabilities. Concerns echoed in a 2018 lawsuit brought by a former employee who claimed he'd been wrongfully fired for blowing the whistle on the vehicle's maximum range himself. To those asking, hashtag Titan, did not perform well on my dive, Gates wrote. Ultimately, I walked away from a huge opportunity to film Titanic due to my safety concerns with the at Ocean Gate platform. In 2018, former Ocean Gate employee David Lockridge refused to green light man tests of the submersible, according to the lawsuit. The Washington based company later sued Lockridge for disclosing confidential information and he filed a counterclaim. The lawsuit was settled out of court and Gates made a cryptic comment that there were more flaws with the vessel than publicly known. There's more to the history and design of the Titan that has not been made public, much of it concerning, Gates wrote. The Expedition Unknown host did not immediately respond to a request for comment from Fox News Digital. Like Hamish Harding, who is also aboard the missing sub, it's actually um, a submersible, not a submarine. Gates is a member of the Explorers Club, a research-minded international society of adventurers, many of them very wealthy, including the billionaire Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. So he's a member of the club. The missing Titan sub is estimated to have less than a day's worth of breathable air. They have food and water and authorities said that they have picked up the repeated sounds of banging that we've heard today in the search area and are still treating the mission as a search and rescue effort. In case you haven't heard, the missing crew members are Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush. That's the one that Josh Gates went aboard the vessel with. Thank God he wasn't on the vessel. British businessman Hamish Harding who is on King Charles III's Prince's Trust, father and son, Shahzada and Suleiman Dawood, who are members of one of Pakistan's wealthiest families, and Paul-Henri Narjolet, a former French Navy officer and leading Titanic expert. Now, I really believe that because of the blasphemous statement of the captain, that he really brought a curse upon the Titanic. You know, there were people that died during the building of the Titanic. There were people that died, you know, that survived. And then they died later of some tragic illness. Now, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is shortened to NIST, wrote this about the Titanic. NIST reveals how tiny rivets doomed a Titanic vessel. When the remains of the RMS Titanic were discovered more than 12,500 feet beneath the surface of the North Atlantic in 1985, the story of the great liner once dubbed unsinkable by the press began moving from legend into scientific fact. 
Numerous research investigations since that time have pieced together the details of what occurred on April 14th through 15th of 1912 after Titanic struck an iceberg, broke in half, and carried more than 1,500 people to their deaths. One of the most elusive questions, why did the 41,730 metric ton 46,000 short ton ship sink in less than three hours. It was answered in 1998 by National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, metallurgist Tim Foeck. The suspected culprit was one of Titanic's smallest components. The three million wrought iron rivets used to hold the hull sections together. Foick performed metallurgical and mechanical analysis on steel and rivet samples recovered from the Titanic debris field at the bottom of the ocean. His examinations determined that the wrought iron in the rivets contained three times today's allowable amount of slag, which is the glassy residue left behind after the smelting of the iron ore. The slag made the rivets less ductile and more brittle than they should have been when exposed to very cold temperatures like those typically found in the icy seawater of the North Atlantic. This finding strongly suggested that Titanic's collision with the iceberg caused the rivet heads to break off, popped the fasteners from their holes, and allowed water to rush in between the separated hull plates. Microscopic analysis of iron rivets recovered from the Titanic revealed high concentrations of the slag residue in the head area seen as yellow, orange, and red in this picture that may have made them brittle in cold temperatures. Helping support the rivet theory are two bits of supporting evidence. First, sonar mapping of Titanic's starboard hull buried in the ocean floor revealed only six thin tears from the iceberg with a total area open to the sea of only one square meter, which is 12 square feet, or less than that of two sidewalk squares. This dispelled the long-believed myth that the iceberg ripped a 90-meter or a 300-foot gash in the side of the ship. The actual damage could not have resulted in the flooding that overwhelmed Titanic's watertight compartments. Secondly, photographs of Titanic's sister ship, the RMS Olympic, taken after it collided with another vessel in 1911, clearly showed dozens of vacant holes in the hull from which rivets popped. Did you know that experts believe that if Titanic had hit the iceberg head-on instead of striking it on the starboard side, the liner would likely have stayed afloat? By turning in a futile attempt to avoid collision, Titanic took the full pressure of the iceberg against its hull, likely resulting in the fatal rivet popping and separation of the hull plates. Titanic was equipped to carry 64 lifeboats, and yet it left Southampton, England on its maiden and last voyage, which is 20 lifeboats. Only 28 persons were aboard the first lifeboat launched after the collision with the iceberg, although the craft was designed to seat 65. The parlor suites, the most luxurious rooms on board Titanic, featured a private promenade and cost $4,350 in 1912 equivalent to $108,000 in today's money for a six-day, one-way transatlantic passage. And I think something said that they paid about that much to go down there. Um, it was anywhere from 150000 I heard, to $250,000 to go down there. 
as, uh, you know, just to go down there as a tourist. The tragic sinking of the Titanic over a century ago can be blamed on low-grade rivets that the ship's builders used on some parts of the ill-fated liner. Two experts on metals conclude in a new book. The company Harland and Wolf of Belfast, Northern Ireland, needed to build the ship quickly and at a reasonable cost, which may have compromised quality, said author Timothy Foick. The shipyard was building two other vessels at the same time, adding to the difficulty of getting the millions of rivets needed, he added. Under the pressure to get these ships up, they ramped up the riveters, found materials from additional suppliers, and some was not of quality, said Foak, a metallurgist at the U.S. government's National Institute of Standards and Technology, who has been studying the Titanic for a decade. And did you know that this happened when James Cameron, who filmed the Titanic movie, when he was on a Titanic submersible dive, he was on this mission to the Titanic as 9-11 unfolded. The Titanic director who completed submersible dives to the wreckage of the Titanic said he was presumably the last man in the Western Hemisphere to find out about 9-11. Nearly 13,000 feet underwater, James Cameron was again tucked inside a submersible vessel toward the bottom of the North Atlantic on one of his many dives documenting the Titanic. But as the crew finished its dive near the wreckage of the 1912 sinking that killed an estimated 1,500 people, Cameron and his colleagues had no idea of the American nightmare that awaited them on the surface. Isn't that weird? that he was down at that tragic site while another tragedy was happening on land. The date was September 11th, 2001, when Cameron climbed down from the steps of his submersible inside the expedition's main ship. The Titanic director was told what had happened 12 hours earlier. Roughly 3,000 people were killed in terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center in New York at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania, and thousands more were injured. What is this thing that's going on, Cameron asked actor Bill Paxton, starred in Cameron's 1997 film about the ship and would later be part of the expedition for the 2003 documentary Ghosts of the Abyss. It's kind of interesting that the documentary was Ghosts of the Abyss because if the prophet Daniel said a beast is a king, and we know that King Charles III is the British monarch, and we have the beast coming out of the abyss, speaking of this British ship, I think that's really interesting. Not that it's the beast or anything, but just them using the word that the ship is down in the abyss, in the sea. Okay, so... This documentary, Ghosts of the Abyss, I just wanted to mention that for whatever it's worth. The worst terrorist attack in history, Jim Paxton replied, as Paxton explained to Cameron and the stunned crew about the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center's Twin Towers only minutes apart, the filmmaker who dedicated years of his life to bringing both the historical and fictionalized versions of the Titanic story to the world, realized he was presumably the last man in the Western Hemisphere to learn about what had happened. It was almost like he was on a different planet being down there. Isn't that strange? The September 11th attacks also forced Cameron to question why crew members were still diving towards the Titanic at that crucial moment in time. <laughs> so they were diving towards this cursed ship that the blasphemy had been said over it at the same time that this tragic event with people losing their lives was happening on land. The day the 9-11 terrorists murdered 3,000 people in New York and Washington, I was just diving to the Titanic, he told the German outlet in 2012, Der Spiegel. For a while I thought, 
Why are we diving into history while new parts are made, while the very ground we are standing on is shaking? He added in the documentary, we were all very wrapped up in what we were doing, and we all thought it was desperately important. And then this horrible event happened and slammed us into this perspective. One of Cameron's crew members agreed, the morning after the attack on September 11th, I kept thinking how trivial this expedition suddenly became. So the people on the submersible, I'm sure that they're feeling that same thing. Uh, it wasn't really worth risking their lives for. He said it just wasn't a big deal anymore. Many are now reflecting on the Titanic and the dives to the wreckage as the search for a submersible vessel that vanished on an expedition to the site um, when this was written enters its third day. Rescuers and officials are concerned about the rapidly dwindling supply of emergency oxygen for the five people on the deep sea submersible which lost contact with the Canadian research vessel Polar Prince during a dive 900 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts on Sunday morning. Finding the submersible that far underwater has been described by experts as a monumental task. The wreckage of the Titanic, which was touted as unsinkable before it hit the iceberg and sank in April of 1912, lies on the ocean floor under 12,500 feet of water, roughly 370 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, a province in northeastern Canada. Cameron's experience in the submersible dives dates back decades. When he signed on to direct Titanic, he made about 12 trips to the wreckage on a submersible, according to National Geographic. He recalled to another infamous magazine in 2009 that he made the film because he wanted to dive to the shipwreck, not because he said, not because I particularly wanted to make the movie. The Titanic was the Mount Everest of shipwrecks, and as a diver, I wanted to do it right, he said. Cameron got the deep sea diving bug and eventually made more than 70 submersible dives, including 33 to the Titanic, logging more hours on that ship than Captain Edward Smith himself, the one who had blasphemed God. A submersible is different from a submarine in that it is supported by a surface vessel, platform, shore team, or submarine. Cameron, who did not immediately respond to an interview request Tuesday, also told the infamous magazine that he was aware of the dangers of going in a submersible thousands of feet underwater. You don't want to put a big emphasis on it because you're there to do a job and stay focused, he said. But every time I close the hatch of a submersible, I say to whoever's gathered to see us off, I'll see you in the sunshine. Of course, there's no sunshine down there, so to say that means you're coming back to the surface. Paxton, who died in 2017, recalled to The Guardian in a 2002 interview how in August and September of 2001, he was helping Cameron make Ghosts of the Abyss, which mimicked the opening sequence in Titanic. He was back on the ship and not in the submersibles when some of the crew members found out what was happening hundreds of miles away on land in Manhattan. When we first got word, Jim had just gone down with the two subs, Paxton said, adding that it was the last dive of the day before Hurricane Aaron arrived. Cameron and the crew had lost one of their robotic cameras, Elwood, named for one of the Blues Brothers, and they were attempting to recover it. Don Lynch, the official historian of the Titanic Historical Society, who was on one of the two submersibles at that time, recounted to the Reagan Foundation how the crew got an acoustic call from Cameron's brother telling the filmmaker how there had been a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and all flights were grounded. These two sentences didn't seem to connect. Lynch said in 2017, noting that they believed terrorist attacks typically involved bombings. We ended up getting so involved in the dive that we pretty much forgot about it. 
When they came back up, Cameron and the crew were excited to talk about how they had retrieved Elwood, but the euphoria quickly dissipated once they were appraised of the scale of the recent attacks on U.S. soil. It was the strangest feeling that I had left the surface and I had left one world behind, Lynch said. When I came back, it was a new planet. It was a whole different world, and there was no going back. Paxton echoed the sentiment to the Guardian. I said, Jim, the world changed from the time you went down to you came back. So he went down to the Titanic wreck. And in that time, where all the people drowned and perished in the Titanic, this tragic event was happening at the surface. It was strange. We felt a little bit like survivors out there. In the days following the 9-11 attacks, Cameron wrestled with why he and others were still doing submersible dives all these years after the 1912 disaster, but he soon understood that his 1997 film, an Oscar-winning cultural phenomenon that made more than $2.25 million at the box office, offered a blueprint for how people could cope with a tragedy that had a death toll twice as high. Some days later, I realized that Titanic gave us help in interpreting the new disaster, in exploring the feelings of loss and anger, he told Spiegel International. Why do people watch Titanic? It's partly because they can cry. Loss is a part of our life. It's about love and death, and about death partly defining love. And these are things we all have to cope with. What I find interesting is, you know, for the Titanic to be headed to New York, and then he's down at the, and it didn't make it, it sank and all these people perished, and he's diving down to it. And of course the Twin Towers were attacked in New York at that moment. So that is so weird. So I really believe that the reason why it freaks me out. Everything about seeing the Titanic or any parts of it that they brought back up from the sea, from the abyss, is quite profound. I just think that's really astonishing that they use the word that this Titanic ship was down in the abyss. Because we have a beast rising from the abyss and a beast is a king in Revelation, but because if King Charles III is the one Israel will see as their anointed one, isn't it interesting that Titanic was a British registered ship in the White Star Line that was owned by a U.S. company in which famed American financier John Pierpont, J.P. Morgan, was a major stockholder. Titanic was built in Belfast, Northern Ireland by Harland and Wolf for transatlantic passage between Southampton, England and New York City. I just think that that curse, something about it, is still alive today. I really believe that. I just want to mention this verse in Revelation 17 8 the beast which is a king which you saw once was now is not at the time of the writing of this and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was now is not, and yet will come. So in understanding that if King Charles III sits over Israel, you know, like if they join the Commonwealth, as they've been talking about doing, apparently behind the scenes, as well as the Palestinians, and then King Charles III would be like figurehead the king over both, and he would broker the peace between the two. Um, this, this ancient monarchy is what once was, and at the time of the writing of this, they had no king, and yet this king will come, the reconstituted monarchy. So this ancient 
beast of the ancient monarchy of Judah and Israel will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction because they're going to put an earthly king on that throne instead of choosing God as their king. So it's interesting that it uses the word abyss about the Titanic in the deep sea submerged Titanic, the British ship Titanic, and then you have the British monarch. Very interesting, a beast rising out of the sea, a beast rising out of the abyss. <laughs> So I just so I'm sure there's thousands of people that are praying for them to be rescued. So I'll see you in the next video and good night for now.